So today's video is the first in a two-part series on how to automatically re-encode downloaded media into H.265 video using a combination of sonar, radar and handbrake. This first part is the what, the why and the how. So if this sounds interesting, then let's get started. So, when I first started making this video, I thought I'd put it all into one video, but then about halfway through making it, I thought it's going to be better to split into two parts. Well, all of our servers are set up slightly differently. We all have our shares set up in our own individual ways, so it's difficult for me to guide you exactly how to do this without explaining fully the principles I'm going to be using to get all of this working. So this first part is going to concentrate on that. So please don't just skip to the next part as watching this part will honestly make the second part much easier to understand. So anyway, just to get started on the subject, let me tell you why I want my media to be re-encoded as it downloads. Oh yes, on a side note and a kind of disclaimer, I would never download anything I don't already own a hard copy of on DVD or Blu-ray. Now, I'm sure none of you guys would download anything you shouldn't either, but I just have to say, Space Invader doesn't condone piracy. Right, so let's take my server and have a look at its array. And you can see here that I've got an array of six disks that comes to 19 terabytes. And that's almost full now, leaving only two terabytes. So it looks like pretty soon, I'm gonna to have to increase the size of my array. But to do that, it's going to be quite expensive. I don't want to have more than six disks in the array, and my parity disk look is four terabytes. So I'm going to have to increase the size of the parity disk before I can increase the size of one of my data disks. And to increase the size of my parity drive to an eight terabyte, it's going to cost me around 200 pounds. And even though I do hate spending money, I'm going to have to pull the trigger on this one and buy this drive. Mmm, so 200 pounds later, yes, I've got an eight terabyte parity drive, but I've still only got two terabytes free on my array. So to get some more space, really what I should do is upgrade that lone three terabyte drive to an eight terabyte. But right now I just can't really afford to spend another 200 pounds on another eight terabyte drive. So what can I do to stop this two terabytes getting used up really quickly? So what I'm going to have to do is work out how I can be more efficient in storing my files in future. And like most of us do, I've got loads and loads of media files, lots of movies and TV shows. They're taking up the majority of the space on my server. So is there a better way that I could be storing these files? And the answer is, well, maybe yes. Now, when we first set up our MB and Plex servers, the chances are that most of our media is going to be H.264. And H.264, for those of you who don't know what it is, it's a video compression standard and has probably been the most popular format since around 2014. However, its origins go way back further, right back to the first draft in 2003. So it's been around for a while. Well, is there anything more efficient? Yes, there is, and that's H.265. And this has roughly double the data compression ratio and offers the same quality. Or put another way, two video files at the same size, the H.265 one will be better quality. However, there is a downside to H.265. To play a direct stream, an H.265 stream will take more processing power on the client side. And some older devices, they won't even play a direct 265 stream at all. Now, this isn't really a showstopper, because Plex and MB would just transcode it on the fly to these devices anyway. But if you don't know much about H.265 and H.264, I would suggest just to read up on the pros and cons of each before jumping in. Now, whilst I'd love to convert all of my media to H.265, and to reduce my media share right down in size, well, that would be a mammoth task and I can't even begin to think how long it would take to re-encode multiple terabytes of video files. So the next best thing to do is to make sure that all future media files that are downloaded on my server are automatically re-encoded to H.265. 
So what I want to happen is if I download a TV show from Sonar or a movie from Radar, then that particular media file is automatically re-encoded into H.265. Now I've been thinking about doing this for a while, but I've never really got round to it. And that's because if you look up how to do this online, then you won't find very many methods, and the ones that you do find, they're rather difficult to set up. But because us on Raiders are using Docker containers for our download clients and for Sonar and Radar, well there is a different way that I thought of that will make this work. And that's by using custom Docker path mapping. So now let me explain the principle of how all this works. So let's take a download client. First let's take NZB get. Let's go and have a look at the template that makes this container work. We can see here the volume mapping. Let's take a closer look at that. Here we see the container path, that's forward slash data. And you can see here that's mapped across to the host path on the server, it's mapped to the download share. And for those of you who are not really 100% sure what mapping is, inside a Docker container, it has its own file system. And here's an example of some of the folders that you might find in that file system. Now the file system of the container is totally separate and isolated from that of the server. And here's an example of some of the file system that you might find on the server. These are some of my shares. And what mapping does is map the container path, and the example here is the forward slash data, to the host path on the server, which is my share, which is located at forward slash mnt forward slash user forward slash downloads. So as far as the container is concerned, all of my files in the download share and all of its subdirectories as well, the container just thinks they're local to it in forward slash data. And also, of course, the container can't see any of the other shares or files on the server. And for all you sci-fi fans out there, you could kind of think of Docker mapping a bit like a stargate that goes from the container through to the server. Well, okay, I'll shut up. Let's carry on. So now let's start up NZB get and have a look at its paths. If we go to settings and then click on paths, we can see here this is the main directory where everything's going to go to. By default, that's set to forward slash downloads. But we want to have that to be the forward slash data, because that's where our mapping is. So if we remember, that's my download share. And then within there, it will create these subdirectories, the completed one, the intermediate one, and a folder that stores the NZBs, queues, and a temporary folder. So all of these will be created inside of my download share. So the location of these folders from within the container would be data forward slash completed, data forward slash intermediate, and so on. So now let's have a quick look at Sonar. Now bear with me, I will get to the point as to why I'm showing you all of this in a moment. So now let's have a look at the template for Sonar. And you can see here, the container path again is forward slash data, and that points as well to the download share. So the location within the container is the same as the location in the container for NCB get, it's forward slash data. Now let's go across to the web UI of Sonar and have a look there. And in Sonar, if we go to our settings and then to the download client, this is where we'd add our download client and here we'd add NCB get. And now because we've added NCB get into Sonar, Sonar knows to expect the location of the completed NCBs to be in forward slash data forward slash completed. And that's because Sonar will basically ask NCB get where that file path is. And Sonar will keep looking in this folder all of the time for completed downloads. And then it can move them to where you keep your media. And now here comes the really sneaky bit. We can use some custom Docker mapping and map this data forward slash completed folder to somewhere totally different on the server. And by doing that, that's where Sonar is going to be looking for completed files. So let's go back to our Sonar template and we're going to add another path. For the name, I'm just going to call it data forward slash completed. And obviously the container path, I want that the same, data forward slash completed. Now remember, that's where Sonar is going to be looking for the completed NCBs. So I'm actually going to put it in my handbrake output file. So now you can see here that the forward slash data is mapped to my download share, but the subfolder forward slash data completed is actually mapped across to handbrake's output folder. 
and how we'd use this custom mapping is we'd set up a handbrake container and what we'd do is we'd map across its watch folder over to NZB Get's completed folder. And for the output folder, I'm going to choose the handbrake output, the same folder that I mapped across for the completed for Sonar. So now let's see the workflow that will happen when Sonar downloads an NZB. It's going to send it across to NZB Get and wait for it to download whilst keeping on checking the completed folder that it's aware of. And so once the NZB is downloaded, it's going to go into NZB Get's completed folder. And this completed folder is also Handbrake's watch folder. And because the NZB file is a media file, Handbrake will now re-encode this and then put it into the output folder. And this output folder is the custom folder that Sonar just thinks is NZB Get's completed folder. So when it sees the media file here, Sonar has no idea that it's actually been through Handbrake at all and it will just treat it as the normal file that it would have downloaded itself and move it to either Plex or Envy. So that's the basic principles of how this is going to work. In the second part of this video, I'm going to show you how I've set this up on my server. Now, even though I don't like using torrents personally, I will show you how to use this with both Usenet and torrents. Torrents are a bit more tricky, as we need to keep them seeding. So I'll show you how to automatically unzip them and then re-encode them whilst leaving the original files to keep seeding. I'll also show you such things as scheduling handbrake to only come on at night and encode then, when you're not using the server. And I'm sure there'll be a couple of other things I can't remember now that will be in there too. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video and it will help you get some automation going with your media. So if you liked it, then please hit up that like button and subscribe to the channel. Now, a massive thanks to the guys who make these videos possible, to all my Patreons. Guys, thank you so much for your support. Anyway, so that's the end of this video. So whatever you're up to for the rest of the day, I hope it's good and I'll catch you in the next video.